Okay. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin in the name of God. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I praise God, the Lord of all the worlds. And I greet you with a greeting of peace and mercy. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is a, uh, it's actually a very special talk for me. I've given, I, 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 I lose count, but probably thousands of talks now. Um, but this is actually very special for me. And so thank you for inviting me. And the reason why it's very special for me is that 30 years ago, I embraced Islam in this very masjid, actually. It was where I took my shahada. And uh, I was uh, 16, well, just a few months shy of my 17th birthday. I've come to realize now, now I'm 47 years old, that I was a very, very strange teenager. Um, I just didn't realize it at the time. I thought I was perfectly normal. Um, I think I was very, very strange. But I embraced Islam. Uh, as I say, 30 years ago. And this was one of the few places where I could feel at home, where I didn't feel strange. And it used to be downstairs, um, alhamdulillah, and Brother Yusuf uh, Islam, uh, AKA Cat Stevens, used to give the talk, and uh, often. And I remember he used to come in, mashallah, mashallah, with his dear wife and his daughters, and Muhammad, when, his son Muhammad, when he was, Muhammad was about, a year, I guess, maybe 18 months, something like that. And his little daughters used to be wearing their floral dresses. If any of you are around from those times, you'll remember them. They used to come in with their white socks. And actually, the other day, I saw one of his daughters at an event, mashallah, mashallah, um, with four children of her own. And I, subhanallah, you suddenly feel very, very old. Um, but this, this, this place, and uh, Brother Nagal and his uh, wife, Samina, we had a welcome to the mosque. And he assures me it was in 1990, so I would have been 19. And that was my first foray into actually Muslim events. And I produced a poster or a series of posters on women in Islam for, for you guys. Um, and we stayed up all night to put up this exhibition. I remember coming, going home and just collapsing. Um, but uh, it was my first foray into sort of... Uh, into events and I, I cut out loads of women's magazines and then did the text. This is all the, in the days well before um, uh, desktop publishing, computers or anything very, very fancy and sort of printing it up, blowing it up on A3 pages and then them coming along and saying to me, oh sister, you can tell that you worked in, that you've been involved or grew up in, 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 in sort of like fashion and industry and things like that because of course I did. I grew up in a model agency, literally. Um, anyway, so I will not go on, but thank you very much. This is a very, very special place for me, and it really is a delight to be here today. And may Allah um, bless you all for your consistent decades, decades of work for this circle, and bless, bless the mosque that brings us all together. And inshallah today, this will be a gathering for those who are, when we gather in the name of Allah, to, to recall Allah's name, to, to praise Allah, to, to reflect. Then the angels are here. And may this be a gathering of angels, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. So, um, I was going to do a quick census because, I don't know, in my day this used to be a place where a lot of us used to come, us new Muslims. Can I just say, after 30 years, when do you become an old Muslim? Or at least, if not a new Muslim, at least just a Muslim, you know? Um, sometimes I meet teenagers or guys who are in like, you know, their early 20s, and they're, oh, you're a new Muslim. I'm like, brother, I've been, a, I've been a Muslim, you know, a decade and a half longer than you've been born. I think I'm entitled to not be a new Muslim. But, so, you know, a quick census, though. Are we, uh, are we, are we new Muslims? Hands up. Okay, and are we? We're a few new Muslims. Are we old? Are we born Muslims? Born Muslims? Uh, we can all get into the whole issue of how many of us are born Muslims. And uh, or anybody, you know, you just were going for the cricket, the test match, and got lost. No, no none of those. Oh, I well, won. Oh, right. Okay. So, so anyway, so I've got kind of 30 minutes. I'm going to try and truncate that, but you know, a speaker and a podium. I mean, it's hard. Um, but I'm going to break it into three. The talk title's 30 Years a Muslim. Um, yeah, 30 years a Muslim. When I was 16, did I ever imagine that my life would be what it was? Absolutely not. Um, so break it into three parts. Kind of super, super quick how I became a Muslim because 
then it saves me having to answer that question sort of uh, 75 times when we finish. Um, two, a speed, tour, a speed tour through the past 30 years of being a Muslim. And uh, a final sort of third and a reflection on why I actually stay Muslim. Because I think that there's one thing becoming Muslim, but there's another staying Muslim. And I think that many, many of our brothers and sisters who do embrace the deen don't always stay in the deen for many, many reasons. But I've stayed in the deen and I will reflect on, on why I'm still here. And then if we've got time and with the chair's permission, we'll kind of uh, open it up to questions. Does that sound like a plan? All right. OK, so bismillah. So why did I become a Muslim? Well, look, I've always believed in God. My mum says that basically from the age of like two, when I had sort of co any form of cognition, I've always believed in God. And I think that that is right. I mean, you know, I'm not right. It's as natural to me as breathing, believing in God. I, I can't imagine not believing in God. I, I, I actually don't understand. I can't functionally understand the idea of, of not believing in God. Um, but it's not just um, sensory, it's not just a sort of, I've got to have faith. It is also, for me, the only logical choice. And that's kind of the situation of, and my, my kids ask me and have asked me over time, what, what, what was before God? And it's like, well, nothing. And it really, really, particularly my eldest son, really, really freaks him out. It, it terrifies him almost. That, what could be before God? Well, there can be nothing before God. But we kind of go back and we go back and we go back and, you know, science, and we come back to this big bang. It's a theory, but it, we come back to this. But then ask the question, well, what was before that? And to some extent, we have two choices. One choice is, well, there was nothing. We just kind of emerged, ask hydrogen, carbon, whatever atoms, emerged out of nothing. That's choice one. Or, it emerged out of something, and I'm using the word something very, very loosely because it's not a thing, but it emerged out of, let's call it X. It emerged out of X. Um, and we don't know what that X is. And throughout time, we have named that X. And in English, we call it God and, you know, it, Deus, Theos. Uh, and in, in Arabic, it's the definitive article of the word God, Al-Illah, the God. And we don't know what that God is. God is. So we could just call it X, but it's, it's, and I, again, I say it very, very, language is so unhelpful. It really, really is. It's so limiting and it limits our minds. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of studies on that, but there's something and we call it through our different traditions in different ways. And that just makes more sense to me. We don't have to know what that something is, but it's the choice of nothing or a something that's beyond my knowledge. And that always just seems much more logical to me. Now, how did I get to believing in Islam? How did I get to being a Muslim? Well, I've always believed in God. And because I grew up in a Christian family, being a Christian was the way I, I, I expressed that. And I was deeply religious at 14. I guess I used to have conversations about taking holy orders, about becoming a nun. I, I, I thought that if I was, either I was going to be prime minister, so sort of socially conscious, very political, going to change the world that way, or I was going to become a nun, you know, Mother Teresa, and save the world that way. God's got a sense of humor, and neither of those take place, obviously, because I've become a Muslim. Um, but I was deeply, deeply religious. And then my brother goes and marries a Muslim. And I'm very angry with him. Because all of the imagery we have around Islam today and Muslims today, we had back in the late 70s and early 80s. This is nothing new, actually. That kind of narrative imagery is nothing new that we see today. Maybe it's more intensified by social media, et cetera, et cetera, but it's nothing new. So I had all of those images. It's got something to do with a black box in the Middle East. It's got something to do with you know, airplanes and dodgy business. And I got you know, caught between two women when I was five years old at Oxford Street in Marks and Spencers between two women who bent down and they had yashmaks on and it had something to do with that. But really, I actually know nothing about it. <coughs> And my mum says, well, you do know that these Muslims, they believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. And I was like, well, no, not sure I believed her either. But went to the library, looked up, picked up a Quran. I must have been 14 or so, or 15. Back, looked it up in the back. Jesus, born of virgin, and read the book. And it was like, well, at least they got something right. Um, and that was kind of my attitude towards them. But then my brother, as I say, gets married, falls in love. 
they're going to have a baby. They're going to call it the baby all of these foreign names. Ironically, my children are called Hassan, Sumaya, and Amira. Um, but at the time, the idea of my brother having a baby with a foreign name really freaked me out. It shows you how liberal I was. Um, and I got to deal with my prejudices. And my mother, ma mashallah, was very switched on about prejudices and rights and, and not being that prejudiced person. And it was that very, those thoughts in my head. Your prejudice is born of ignorance. Your ignorance is due to fear. Get rid of your ignorance. You'll get rid of your fear, etc., etc. And so that's what I did. And I began to study Islam. And I found a religion that believed in one God, believed in the same prophets that I did, believed in revelation, believed in angels, believed in judgment, believed in a soul. It was like, mashallah, wow. Well, it wasn't mashallah. It was like, oh, wow. That's good. But I had no desire to become a Muslim. And then I lost my faith in the church. And this is very painful. And that's, very, that's a very lengthy discussion, but it's all to do with the unification of Italy and uh, papal infallibility and you know the 40 gospels submitted to the Council of Nicaea and only four got chosen, what's in the other 36? Um, you know, and questions like this. And so I lose my faith and it's a very, very profound loss because I love being a Christian. And actually of all the things in my life I'm most grateful about, is that I have known and loved God through two world faiths. And I think, it's, I think that's a real privilege of being somebody who has embraced Islam from a faith position. Rather than feeling like, oh, I've, I've, I've converted or I've rejecting. No, it's been a journey for me. And I'm utterly, absolutely, 100% grateful that I have had that journey and that I have, as I say, known and loved the one, the merciful, the divine creator of the universe through two traditions, authentically. And it gives me great respect for, for, for that in general. But anyway, so I lose my faith in the church, but I don't lose my faith in God. And I, I carry on studying, I carry on believing, I carry on praying, I carry on fasting, I carry on trying to be a decent human being. I have a Muslim friend, she says, why don't we go to this event? I say, okay. I, I rock up to this event in Battersea in a sort of old converted house. The talk's all right. I have visual memories of this Pakistani lady rocking this baby, but that's about it, really. Um, and then she, uh, she, we go downstairs, she says, will you help me tidy up? I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, there's teacups, etc., to wash up. So we do, and she says, look, it's my prayer time. Do you mind if I pray? I'm like, no, it's fine. And she goes down and she, I watch her pray, and I, I've never really seen anyone pray up until this point. Despite all my theoretical studies, I'd never seen anyone pray. And she stands, as you do, and she does Raku, and she stands, and then she goes into prostration. And at that moment, seeing somebody put their head, which we hold so lofty, which is so grand, which is us and our identity and me and my, my ego and my ego and me and I, and she puts it on the floor to the lowest position she can. And she completely submits this, this body and herself to God. And at that moment, literally at that moment, I thought, Islam means to surrender. Islam is essentially surrender. And that is what I'd been wanting to do for my entire life, to surrender myself to the one true God. And I thought at that moment, I want this. I want this in my life. And as I say, I was 16, three months shy of my, my 17th birthday. It's been a very, very long journey since then. Um, and strangely, when you embrace Islam, everyone wants to know why and it was 1988 it was Salman Rushdie affair it was you know and suddenly you become responsible for answering questions of a billion plus people in the world oh you know why do Muslims do this why do Muslims do that well I remember a relative after the Pan Am bombing over Lockerbie sitting down and looking at me and saying why do you do this using the pronoun you this is me who went on anti-apartheid marches, me who went on CND marches, me who is a pacifist, me who, you know, goes out of my way to, to sort of, you know, put out spiders, who can't stand spiders, to, but to put out spiders, you know, to, to carefully let out bees, to, to sort of, you know, who wouldn't do, tries to sort of not harm, and why do you do this? 
And all of a sudden, you find yourself explaining. Of course, I mean, I'm 16, right? 17, then you get to be 18, 19, you come into the, melt into the mosque, you're doing display. And before you know it, you're on podiums. Well, before I knew it, I was on podiums. It was terrifying. And in those days, I used to have my script written out verbatim, can I just say, um, until it got to the point that I would know the scripts. And before I knew it, I was doing four national talks a week. And before I knew that, Allah's, Allah plans, really, wallahi, I never planned. But I, I was doing, I, I went and I thought, let me test my faith. I decided to study uh, theology in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College London. Who is, King's College is set up against the godless institution of Gower Street. So Gower Street UCL was set up um, as a secular institution. UCL, uh, King's College was set up against the godless institution of Gower Street. Its theology department is where we train priests a lot. Um, and I went there, I was, I think, the very, very first Muslim to ever be in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, to my knowledge, to, to do the undergraduate degree, and I did my degree there. And, and my actual point at that point was, just maybe try and convert me back, because I wanted my foundations. Having gone through conversion once and, and lost my faith once, I wanted to be on steady ground to build my adult life, if that makes any sense. I didn't want to be on rocky ground, but to be challenged. And I think it's really, really, really important that we allow ourselves to be challenged, one thing I have never, ever been afraid of are questions. Because questions are our way to get to truth. And the Quran is dedicated to people who think. Allah is asking us to think. So as people who, who believe in the book, who, if we believe in the Quran, then we believe in thinking. And we believe in challenging. And we believe in asking questions. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. Because I, one thing is I'm absolutely certain in my life, whenever I've had a question about Islam, it has always been answered. Always. Sometimes it's taken time. Sometimes I've had to overcome my own sense of, 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 of my own sense of trying to work things out, but it's always been answered. So we shouldn't ever be afraid. So I wanted to do my degree, and I did my degree, and I loved it. But before I knew it, as I say, I was on podiums, and then you, you get around and you do enough, you knit, whatever. And, and before I knew it, I was on radio, and before I knew it, I was on the world service. I still get people to this day from tiny places in parts of the world that I've never heard of, geography has never been my strong point, um, who come up to me and say, I used to hear you on the World Service you know, 27 years ago. It's, it's strange, but Allah, this is what Allah chose. And then I went into TV, etc., blah, blah, blah. And then 9-11 took place. And so I've been a Muslim, uh, I don't know, 13 years or whatever. By this point, I had three children. But I'd done so much, so much, so much in terms of media by this point. And my daughter was born in the August, and it took place in the September. I stuck her in a papoose, and I had a very big scarf. And sometimes I would feed her on stage. I don't know what this is about. You can't feed in pop. I would feed her anywhere, um, and with a very large scarf. And I went to town halls. We came, we did an event here, actually. We did an event here because we got so much hate mail um, in, in a particular organization that I, I, I supported and, and helped and tried to help. Got so much hate emails, but we responded to virtually every one of them, except for the really, 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 really violent ones that you know, were not pretty. But anyone who was like, uh, why? I can't believe this, etc. We responded, and all of those people who then we entered into a communication with, we came to an event here. But basically, I then spent a year of my life, town halls, mosques, synagogues, uh, ch school halls, CNN, BBC, Sky, you name it, saying Islam is anti-violence, anti-terrorism, anti-extremism. A year of your life defining yourself in the anti. A year of my life bringing this very, very ugly thing putting it centre stage and saying, I'm against that. What does that do to you? What does that do to your psychology, your sense of self? Well, I'll tell you what it did to me. I was exhausted to the point I couldn't lift my arm above my head. September 2002, I could not lift my arm above my head. To brush my hair, collapsed me. Absolutely could not cope with it. And I decided I can't do this anymore at an event. Actually, it was again here. This room's had a lot of stuff, actually. An event here, it was a um, one-year anniversary. And I ended up, the media were here. And I ended up doing the dua. I don't know how. But, and I, I just, I can't, I can't do this anymore. 
We've got to say what we're for. We can't keep saying what we're against. We've got to be expressing our identity in terms of what we understand our contribution to the world could be. We're for justice. We're for the planet. We're for human beings. We're for equity. We're for, we're for so many beautiful things, for art and beauty and sustainability and optimization as a monetary policy instead of maximization. We're for the poor. We're for what are we for? And it came, well, how are we going to do this? And so we decided, my husband and I, to create a magazine. Because we both been, had run student magazines, it was the, we couldn't start a TV company, we didn't have that type of money. And we started this magazine, and we called it ML. There you go, I put out a few copies of whatever I could carry. I think lots of people have taken them, which is great. Share them around, please. Um, and ML comes from the letter M and the letter L, standing for Muslim life. Because that's what we were trying to define, to try and express and to say, well, what does it mean to be Muslim in the 21st century? What does it mean to be a British Muslim in the 21st century? And so we decided that Amel would articulate and promote a Muslim, a modern Muslim identity and ask the questions. And we had four C's. And the first C was that we was about confidence. Because confident people. People who are self-aware and who feel good about themselves and who know who they are are much better at doing the second C, which is to contribute. And what do we want to contribute to? Because is Islam for Muslims? Well, no, because the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a mercy to mankind, was not sent as a mercy to the Quraysh, was not sent as a mercy to, to the Muslims. He wasn't sent just to his people, his tribe, he wasn't sent just as a mercy to the Arabs, he wasn't sent just as a mercy to the Muslims, even though we are his ummah. No, he was sent as a mercy to mankind, and it's a mercy. A mercy, not a scourge, not a, not a protest, not an, not an anger, not a storm, not a typhoon, a mercy to humanity. And so we decided that confidence, because confident people contribute to the common good. Because we're all in this together, you know, none of us get out alive, that's one thing we can be certain of, death and taxes, but the, the death bit, none of us get out of this planet alive. So we're in this together, whatever faith we are, whatever race we are, whatever gender we are, whether we're rich, whether we're poor, we're in this together, sink or swim, together. And we also wanted to connect, to talk about connections, connections to God and connections to each other. And so these were the four C's that we built a melon. And we did this for a decade of our lives. I used to work 18 hour days, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and I did that for a decade. To say that I was exhausted by the end of it is an understatement. But after 100 issues in a decade, we didn't actually choose to stop, but my daughter became ill. And Allah teaches again. Allah teaches in so many ways. He teaches. And the lessons that I've had to learn since 2012, through her illness, where we lost, almost lost her so many times, have been extraordinary. Because Allah tests you with what you love. And I guess, obviously, what I love most is my family. And Allah has tested me with that. And for the past six years or so, that has been my focus in my life. And now, alhamdulillah, mashallah, 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 because Allah is the merciful, the kind, she is slowly, mashallah, coming to health and well-being, inshallah, inshallah. And I suppose I feel an obligation to gently return to the world. And so the third part is now why do I stay a Muslim? Because I became a Muslim, I've lived a Muslim, but why do I stay a Muslim? I think I'm going to make so many reasons, but because it speaks to the human condition. I would say humanity, we say all oh, Muslims are having an existential crisis or, um, you know, we're going through an existential crisis in relation to what it is to be British and Europe, etc. Et I think we're going through an existential crisis 
about what it means to be human. And we actually are losing sight of discussions around humanity, around the essence of being human. Forget being Muslim or Christian or Jewish or Hindu or atheist, or anything, about what it means to be human, about how we connect to others as humans. And Islam provides, and the story of Adam salam, whether you want to give it and make it as allegory or literal, it really, really doesn't matter. And I know, you know, the scholars will go on and on, but the story and the meat is so profound, so profound, that Adam salam and his wife Hawa, they are mutually responsible. It's not, you know, women, Eve tempted Adam and, you know, it's all down to us sisters. It's not. There's the, and they seek forgiveness. They don't try and be like, oh, well, it was Eve's fault. Adam's not blaming Eve. Eve's not blaming Adam. They're not blaming Iblis. They're like, we have wronged ourselves. Right? They recognize their own weaknesses, their own failings. They're like, yep. And Allah forgives. But Allah is also teaching. And says, you've got to learn a while and you've got to toil. And so we, we rail against having to toil, but toil is the human condition. You know, that is, our, that is our condition in this world, to toil. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. And we shouldn't be afraid of failing because, look, they mucked it up big time. They mucked it up, but Allah knew that they were going to muck it up. That was their destiny. It is our destiny. And we'll forget. And that's why that beautiful hadith Qudsi, you know, son of Adam sinned and he had, knew he had a Lord who forgives sins and, and punishes sins, goes to his Lord and the Lord forgives him and he does it again. The Lord forgives him, does it again. The Lord forgives him, finally the Lord's there. Because he knows, he has a Lord who forgives and can punish. Do what you wish, for I have forgiven you. This merciful, merciful, merciful Lord who has forgiven us if we recognize and acknowledge that relationship. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And it speaks to the human condition. I had a, somebody yesterday, yesterday was sort of they were saying, oh, human beings, we're just rubbish. We're just like, we're all, we're just so rubbish. I don't think we are. I think we're magnificent. We are magnificent in our failings, in our faults, in our ridiculousness. Because we have the potential to love each other. Sure, we've got the potential to hate each other. Sure, we manage to kill each other. Sure, we do all sorts of inhumane, terrible, awful things. <coughs> I still think we're magnificent because we have the means to return to goodness. We have the means to excel in so many ways. And it speaks to this human condition. There's a wonderful phrase by a French philosopher. And he talks about us as spiritual beings undergoing a human experience. Because let's face it, we're all after this, this spiritual experience. We kind of want to sort of say, oh, well, you know, we do our prayers hoping for that spiritual experience, that, that fix. You know, got to do a Ramadan, I'm on a spiritual high. Do a Hajj, oh, I feel so spiritually alive. But actually, we got it the wrong way around. We are having this, we are spiritual beings. That is our essence. We were in a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he asked us, do we surrender? And we said, we did. We made a covenant. We don't remember that covenant, but it's there within us. And we said, La ilaha illallah, we made the covenant with God that we surrender. We were spiritual beings. And we've come to this world to have this human experience. And it's a very, very uncomfortable thing. It's a very uncomfortable thing. But this is our purpose. And it's our purpose to come back, to, to engage and have that spiritual growth. 
And so again, I remain a Muslim because it reminds me of that fact, of my human condition, my spiritual essence. It also talks to me in the modern world. And people say, well, you know, Islam, it's an old thing. It's from 15, you know, 100 years ago. It's an, it's an old thing. But Islam is for all people and for all times. Why? Well, I think you can look at it for two ways. You can look at it and you can say, well, Islam is for all people and for all time because we are replicating Arabia in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're just going to replicate it. Like some kind of giant cosmic photocopier, we're going to keep churning out Medina in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't think that that's what it means. For Islam is for all people and for all times. And I, and, I, and I substantiate that because if I look at, say, the fiqh of the great jurist of one of the four, Matab Shafi, who changed 80% of his fiqh moving from Baghdad to Cairo in the same time frame, in a pretty narrow geographic frame, 80% of his fiqh to encompass what? To encompass all of local custom. So there it was, one of the great four Matabs, changing 80% of his fiqh to accommodate the local customs that changed between Baghdad and Cairo in the same time frame. Please, brothers and sisters, explain to me how, how we expect to replicate the Medina of the Prophet Wasallam in the 21st century when we've got AI, artificial intelligent technology, when we have our mobile phones, when we have the world that we live in, do we replicate it and think that that is why Islam is for all people and for all times? It doesn't make sense to me. I believe it's for pe all people and for all times because it generates, it generates solutions and answers based upon ethics and principles that are eternal. Customs, local customs do not travel. They do not travel through time and they do not travel through space. But faith in the one true God is eternal. And so I believe that Islam offers us modernity. It offers us something to say about justice. Be just, for justice is the closest thing to God consciousness. It offers us something to say about environment, because we are stewards. We are placed as vicegerents on this earth to care for this earth. It says something about diversity, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one ahad. And we are multiplicity. And he could as is testified in the Quran, made us all the same, believing all the same, but chose not. Chose that we would be diverse in our tongues, in our colors, in our cultures, in our ways. But Allah is one. And that oneness, that unity, is what the essence of what we surrender to in this deen. It is, this is it, the one. Say he is God, the one, the uncaused cause of all creation. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is nothing that can be compared unto him. The surah that we, we learn almost first, described as a third of the Quran by the Prophet wasallam, about the unity of God. And there's nothing that we can compare. It's the uncaused cause of all creation and the purpose and the reason that we surrender and we do what we are. We can either have textbook Islam, GCSE Islam, where, well, what's it all about? Well, Muslims, they go to this mosque, and there's a, there's a minaret in it, and, we, and, and, and there is a dome. Not in every mosque around the world, can I just say. There is a, a, a mimbar, and we face Mecca, and they have these mats, and they wear these things and some you know these women wear the scarves and they eat this and they do this and these are the five pillars and we can break it down to GCSE textbook Islam or we can see it as an essentially transformative process and it is a process because we are constantly changing we are changing at a cellular level surely we should be growing at a spiritual level day in, day out. And we will be tested. Wallahi, we will be tested. But as the Quran reminds, do you think you will say, we believe and you will not be tested? This is the point. You will. We will. 
And those tests hurt. Wallahi, they hurt. But they can, indeed should, lead us to become closer to the one. My faith has sustained me. It sustains me intellectually because it answers questions about the world. It sustains me spiritually. And that's why I stay a Muslim. And inshallah, I pray I die as one. Inshallah. Okay, that's my 30 minutes. I kind of broke it down into three, <coughs> three segments. Anything I've said of any good is from Allah. The mistakes, they are mine. What is good, may it stay in your heart. What is wrong, may it leave you as quickly as it came from my lips. And inshallah, with the chair's permission, we shall answer some questions, if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you.